welcome everyone to the Nordia House, including those of you who are online. My name is Steve Benson, and I will be doing the introductions tonight. Uh, the featured guest lecturer tonight will be Dr. Scott Burns. Dr. Burns has been a member of Nordic Northwest for over 25 years. He has Danish and Norwegian heritage. He's Professor Emeritus of Engineering Geology at Portland State University and President of the International Association of Engineering Geologists and Environment. He has been teaching at the college level for 53 years with past positions in Switzerland, New Zealand, Washington, Colorado, Louisiana, before coming to Portland State 33 years ago. We know Dr. Burns from his many informative and entertaining Nordic Northwest lectures about the geology and related cultures of the Nordic countries. We also know him from his TV news appearances whenever there's a significant geologic event anywhere in the world. What you may not know is that he is also a wine aficion. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and loves lecturing all around the United States about the terroir of wines, particularly in Oregon. Dr. Burns defines terroir as the influence of geology, climate, grapes, soil, and soil biota on the flavors of wine. Dr. Burns and his students have spent the last 30 years unlocking these secrets. The Willamette Valley is one of the best places in the world to taste the difference in terroir. He also loves leading terroir tasting tours each summer, is looking forward to guiding them for Nordic Northwest. The plan is for Dr. Burns to begin wine tasting tours to local Nordic wineries next summer to taste the different flavors. So watch our website for announcements of the tours when we can go into the field with Dr. Burns to taste wines together while learning the local geology. Dr. Burns. Well, welcome to everybody tonight. Um, I didn't expect many people to be here because we are going through an incredible atmospheric river t right now, and we are going to have between two, two and three inches of rainfall that will have fallen in these, this 24-hour period. What for me, as a geologist, means lots of landslides and debris flows that are going to be coming in, and I'll be busy uh, coming up in the next few days. Um, and so tonight what we want to do is talk a little bit about the terroir of wine, uh, it, which is going to be lots of fun because one of the best places in the world to taste differences in the flavors based on the geology in the world is the Willamette Valley. And, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I've given this talk on all continents. I even gave it in Antarctica on uh, a boat a few years ago for the Smithsonian. Uh, and, and so I enjoy talking about it. And uh, we, uh, we have a lot of wineries that have Nordic uh, origins. And so at the end, I'm going to talk about f at least five of them. And uh, starting next summer, we're going to start having tours. You might be able to join, and I'll be talking about the geology, and then we'll talk about all of the soils and everything like that. So that's the aim of, of doing this tonight. So we're going to be talking about the dynamic terroir of wine. Now, I've been involved in wines for a long time. Back in college, I went to Stanford, I got a couple degrees there, and uh, fraternity brothers said, let's go up and taste wine up in this fledgling new area, not many people have heard about it, called the Napa Valley. And we would do the whole Napa Valley from one end to the other, starting out at uh, Sebastiani and uh, Mondavi in the uh, morning and finishing up at Charles Krug and uh, Christian Brothers at the end of the day. Now it takes you a whole month to do half of that. So it has greatly changed. And then uh, my first teaching job was in Switzerland from 1970 to 75. We were in a ski resort, but down at the bottom of the valley, incredible wines. Uh, and so I made wines with my students every year, and that was a great way of learning all about science, primary fermentation, secondary fermentation, and stuff like that. And so here's a picture of, let's see, i got to turn it on. Here's a picture of me, uh, 1973, the college dedicated the yearbook to me. And so um, these are all bottles of wine that the students took home on the planes in those days to their parents, and they would give them a bottle of white wine 
chalice grape at Christmas time and show their parents that the $3,000 that their parents were paying for a tuition room, board, books, and ski lift ticket was well worth it. Uh, and so now, and then as a professor, you're, you always want to publish articles. My first article, Journal of College Science Teaching, 1976. It was Science Can Be Fun and Tasty, t Winemaking in the Lab. So that's my background. And then I came back to Portland State. I grew up here. I went to Beaverton High School. Uh, and uh, always wanted to come back, and uh, I taught a soils class. In 1907, or 1992, one of the grad students who had to do a project, she said, I want to do it on the soils of the wineries. And I said, wow, I know nothing about those. And we found out that none of the wineries knew anything about it either. Uh, and, and so it led to her little class project, went to a master's thesis, and we basically redid the whole wine industry. At that time, they didn't do single vineyards, and then after we finished doing that in the late 90s, they all switched over to uh, single vineyard uh, uh, types of Pinot Noirs especially. So we had an impact. All right, let's, there we go. There we go. Whoops. There we, we'll get this right. So, in the United States, there's been a major change in drinking habits. Uh, and, and a, a classic study was done to over 20,000 people coast to coast back in 1982 and said, what is your favorite alcoholic beverage that you uh, imbibe in? And so 49% uh, beer, but only 18% uh, wine, and then the other 35% was scotch, bourbon, and martinis, and things like that. But then they redid that in 2012, and there's been a major shift in the United States uh, and, and, and to people really having an interest in wine. And look at the numbers that, are, uh, that have grown to. I mean, back in the 1980s and 90s, did anybody go to wine country uh, on weekends in the summertime? No, because we hardly had any wineries. And now a lot of people go to it, and every state in the United States has a winery. Uh, and, and so uh, people are much more into wines compared to what they were in, in those days. So every time you have a bottle of wine, it's going to be different from the next, the next, the next, based on eight different factors. Number one, the grapes. Cabernet Sauvignon is going to be different from a Riesling, different from a Chardonnay. In the Willamette Valley, where we have Pinot Noirs, there are 12 major clones that we have. The Pomard and Vadensville, but then the Dijon clones, 115777, and think, you'll see all these numbers later on. Uh, and, and so that's going to give you a, a certain flavor. Also, the geology, the rocks that are underneath the vineyard break down into the soils, and those nutrients go into the actual plant that you have got, and that will affect the flavors. Also, climate, huge. When do we invite our friends to come to Oregon? It's always July, August, and September. Why? Because it doesn't rain that time of the year, and we have no humidity here, and that is perfect. Uh, for no rain at the end of the season for growing grapes. Uh, and then also soil hydrology, because we don't irrigate here in the Willamette Valley. You've got to have at least a little silt and clay in the soil to hold water for the end of the season when uh, it, it hasn't rained for two or three months. Uh, and then also physiography. You want to have most of your vineyards facing south to maximize the heat units. And in the old days, we used to say below 900 feet elevation because above that, they aren't going to ripen. Well, now the climate's changed so much, we're up to 1,500 to 1,700 feet that you've got. And what do we mean by ripen? The winemaker wants to have 23 to 25% sugar content, which they call 23, 25 bricks that you have got. Uh, and then all of those things affect the soil biota. The bacteria, the fungi, the, uh, uh, the nematodes, the trematodes, all the things that live in the soils because they will affect the flavors that you have got. Every two years we have the International Terroir Conference and, and all of the biologists tell us that it, the flavors are coming from the soil biota and all these other factors affect them. That is terroir. But there are two other factors that are also going to affect the, uh, the, the, the wines. The winemaker, incredible. Uh, and, and, and the winemaker chooses, do you use native yeast or do you inoculate with the same yeast every year to have the consistent flavor? Or do you oak it or not and use oak barrels? And that drives the price way up. And if you choose oak, is it going to be um, uh, French oak, which is very delicate, or American oak, which is very bold, or Hungarian, which is cheap? 
Uh, and so you have all of these different types that are there. Uh, and uh, whoops, you got to go back to that. Uh, and and then also the and then also do you mal, use malolactic fermentation, which gives that big buttery flavor uh, for a lot of the California Chardonnays. That's the winemaker. And then the vineyard manager. Do the rows go north and south? Do they go east and west? Do you, do you plow in between them? I'm trying to get everybody to stop plowing and have healthy soils here in Oregon. So all of those things affect the terroir. And terroir is a great French term. Uh, developed in Burgundy many, many hundreds of years ago. And it's the taste of the place. It's all the elements of the vineyard that you have got. All those things that I mentioned before. And it's the taste of the place. Some of the wineries will say, it's the sense of the place. You just don't sense the wines, you taste it. And so the taste is what you're dealing with. And it's best expressed in your cool climate grapes, which I'll come back to there. Now we're using this term a lot more for a lot different things. Cheeses. I mean, all of the cheeses or where it's from. Well, that's the terroir of, uh, of those particular things. Hops, if you are into IPAs. All the brewmasters will list where their hops are from, and that's terroir of all of those things. Uh, also, coffee is one. Uh, and and I, all of the different uh, regions are going to have different flavors that you have got. And I gave a talk at one of the four wineries in Vermont in the National Lecture Tour many years ago. And they say, whoa, we use this for maple syrup. We know that Joe Blow's uh, maple syrup down here t completely tastes different from so-and-so's over here. And so all of those are, so we're using this term terroir for so many different things. I got off the airplane in Paris about five or six years ago, and they were talking about the terroir of the milk of the Normandy uh, North Coast that was there. And at Portland State, we've, the younger faculty are picking up some of my techniques and using it for a terroir that we've known for a long time, and that is marijuana, which is legal here. In the old days, we knew where the, which valleys produced the best weed. And so they're wondering why uh, they are. Well, it's the soil and the microclimate and things like that. So Dick Erath, one of the original winemakers in Oregon, said, you know, 80% of all of the wine comes, uh, the quality of the wine comes from the vineyard and only 20% from the winemaker. So he is a terroirist. He's saying the Vineyard is so important. Now, in a very cold year like uh, 1997, uh, 1996, 2007, 2011, the winemaker has to step in and kind of save the thing. But in general, uh, it is the winemaker of the, the, the environment produces the good stuff. Now, here's a map, a kind of washed out map of the world showing you all of the continents. And here, North, boy, this washed out. North America, Europe, Asia, South America, Africa, and Australia. But all of the grape growing areas for Vitus vinifera grapes happens to be uh, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitudes. Uh, and, and so that is the perfect climate that you have got. And within it, then you have your cool climate, intermediate, warm, warm, and hot. And I'll talk about that in a second. So uh, here in North America, we are a grape growing area. Europe, everybody knows about France and Spain and Italy and all of the other places there. You even look over here, China. I've been to China many times. The Great Wall Cabernet. Uh, unbelievable bottles, unbelievable wineries. Is the wine any good? No. But, uh, but, uh, but I mean, they, they're copying everything and eventually they'll get it right. And then South America, the land, uh, Chile, the land of Carmen Air. Uh, and uh, also Argentina uh, that you've got. South, uh, Amer uh, South Africa, great gro grape growing area. Uh, Australia, some of the best reds in the world. And then New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc, where I used to live. And when I lived there, all of the wine came in boxes. And now they do a billion dollars of export of Sauvignon Blanc every year. So let's go back to uh, France, where really modern winemaking uh, started many years ago. And if we draw a line right through the center part of the country, this northern part is cool climate. And so you've got Burgundy. We are the Burgundy of, of, of North America. And the Alsace, that's where the great Pinot Gris come from. Uh, everybody knows about Champagne. Uh, and then the Loire Valley. All of that is cool climate. Now, the southern part is intermediate and warm climate. You've got the Rhone Valley, which is phenomenal for the Syrahs and Viognier. And then Bordeaux is probably the most famous area in the world that you have got. Interesting thing, the climate is warming up. And all of the Champagne 
uh, producers up here have invested in lots and lots of vineyards up in Great Britain. And the reason is it's getting too warm. You've got to have cool climate, a real cool climate. And you pick at maybe uh, 1920 bricks uh, to make a great champagne. And so they are hedging that most of the champagne grapes in the future will be coming from the perfect climate, which will be Britain, instead of champagne in the future. Um, and so in France, when you look at the wine label, it will always tell you the name of the vineyard, the chateau or the uh, winery that it's come from. It will give you the year, the region. Maybe uh, if it's from Burgundy or Bordeaux, it will have a grading. Grand Cru means it's the best stuff. But it will never tell you what the grape is. You're supposed to understand the terroir. If it's red and from Burgundy, you know it's Pinot Noir. If it's white and from Burgundy, you know it's going to be Chardonnay. If it's red and from Beaujolais, it's going to be Gamay. And if it's red from Bordeaux, it's going to be always a combination of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, uh, Merlot, and Cab Franc, or something like that. And so uh, the French have been into this terroir thing for a long time. So this is the Willamette Valley of Europe. This is the Burgundy area, and gorgeous vineyards, and, uh, and they've been making, making Pinot Noir and Chardonnay for years and years and years. But uh, they've, uh, it doesn't matter who the winemakers are, they've known that there are certain wines above which... Uh, are going to be the best wines. doesn't matter who the winemaker is. It's, it's the terroir. And then the next region down is the next best, and down at the bottom you have the worst ones. Uh, and, uh, and so geologists went in and said, let's see if there's a geological difference that is here. And sure enough, in that, this particular area here, here is the Premier Crew from here all the way up here. The Grand Crew is here, and Premier Crew is here. This area up here is all marl. It's a marine... Uh, limestone, but it's a dirty one with a lot of silt in it, and that makes the best ones. Pure limestone is the next best. It's good, but not as good. And so there is, so the geology has some effect upon the flavors that you have got in those particular areas. So we're talking about Vitus vinifera. Vitus vinifera are the grapes that, um, that you are familiar with all of these. As you get back, uh, back east and especially up north in the colder areas, we have a lot of American hybrids like Norton. Uh, and, and so we, we don't grow those here, but other places it gets so cold that the, they have to grow the American hybrids. Uh, so if we look at uh, climate, the world's wi uh, wi best Wine climatologist is an Oregonian, Greg Jones. He used to run the, uh, the, the wine program down at Linfield. Now he has taken over his family's winery, which is Abacella, which is my favorite winery in southern Oregon. And, and, and so he divides all the climates of the world where we grow grapes into cool climate, intermediate warm, warm and hot. And so the actual uh, average temperatures are listed here. I'm sure you're not interested in, but what are some of the examples? Well, cool climate are the German ones, uh, Rhine Valley, Mosul Valley, for instance, and then Burgundy here, uh, Willamette Valley, and Loire Valley. Those are good examples. Intermediate warm, it's getting warmer in those particular areas. So that's southeastern Washington and southern Oregon. Uh, also, you're getting Ro Rioja, Spain, the land of Tempranillo, uh, and then and uh, also Chile and, and, and Beaujolais area of France. And then the warm areas, well, that's Napa, that's Sonoma, that's most of Italy, uh, northern Portugal, uh, most of Spain, etc. that you have got. And then the hot areas, well, that's Lodi, California, the Central Valley that you have got. Uh, and then also southern Portugal and then a couple major valleys that we have in Australia. Uh, and so when you've got those areas, so here we got cool, intermediate, warm, warm and hot. What are the grapes that you grow in those areas? So if you want to start a winery, you say, what is the climate that you have? So if you, if you define uh, your area as being cool climate, you're going to be having all the German style wines. Rieslings, Gewürztraminer, Mueller, Turgau, and then Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, uh, and Chardonnay. Uh, and uh, those are going to be the major ones that you've got here. As you get over to intermediate warm, then you start getting into Sauvignon Blanc, and then the Tempranillo, uh, cool climate, uh, uh, Syrah, Dolcetto, Merlot, and those. And then as you get into warm, then you get into the, the Cabs, Merlots, Syrahs, Viognes, and stuff like that. And then when you get in the really hot areas, that's Zinfandel, uh, Grenache, uh, uh, and, those, and Nebbiolo. And, 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 and raisins. 
Uh, and and so, so the climate is so important in determining what you're going to be growing there. But the ones that are best transparent and the best ones to taste differences in terroir, especially from the soils and the geology, are your cool climate grapes. And the, and the Germans have been showing this uh, forever and ever along the Rhine Valley and the Mosul Valley in their Rieslings. Here, we, uh, Riesling is making a huge comeback. But if you want to compare things, you always got to keep the sugar content the same. Some of us remember Blue Nun, which was, you know, 5% residual sugar. Uh, and, 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 and so they say, ah, I just, I'm not in the Rieslings because they're all sweet. No, most of our Rieslings that we produce in Oregon are, are dry. And on the back of every Riesling bottle, it'll say dry, semi-dry, um, uh, semi-sweet and, and sweet and stuff like that. So you have a rating that is there. And so this is one of the best places in the world to taste cool climate grapes because we have cool climate grapes here. Number one, and number two, um, uh, uh, it's all, I mean, the, the soils are very, very close by to one another, and so you don't have to go 150 miles away uh, to taste the others. Uh, and so it's really, really good. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, as the climate is warming, all of the winemakers in the valley at the lowest elevation areas, they are now planting uh, Tempranillo grapes and cool climate uh, Syrah, because uh, they know that uh, it will ripen, and they are. Uh, they, but we're, we're traditionally a cool climate area, and we shouldn't be planting them, but they are ripening. And so all you got to do is ask all the winemakers around the world, and they will say there is climate warming uh, that is going on. So if you want to uh, start a vineyard, what do you need to have? Number one, you've got to have at least 180 frost-free days a year. We've got that easily here. But growing grapes is contrary to normal agriculture. When you have a garden in your backyard, what do you do? You fertilize it. You don't fertilize vineyards. You want to stress the grapes. You want to have that grape put all of its energy into the grape and not into the leaves and stems. When that grape plant comes back to life in the spring, it says, well, what is my raison d'etre? What is my reason of being? It is to reproduce and produce that grape seed. And so if it has lots of nutrients and lots of water and everything like that, it will grow leaves and stems and leaves and stems, and the old winemaker is going to be a little mad at them uh, because they are not producing that 23 25% alcohol. Uh, and, but it, they come back to life, and the soils are awful, and there's no nutrients and no water. Oh, my God, I'm going to reproduce to you know, get my raison d'etre. And that's when you get your best, best uh, wines that you have got. And, and you can see I've got 1,200 feet elevation here. We're now up to 15 to 1,700. The climate has warmed up in that. Also, overall temperature, once you get below 15, negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit in the wintertime, it'll kill the plants. And so uh, we're very good here in the Willamette Valley. We're a temperate climate, so we don't get those. But eastern Washington sometimes does, and it, it causes big problems. So uh, certain nutrients that you have, uh, 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 Professor White down in Australia has told us we need 10 macronutrients and 6 mic micronutrients that you've got. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, well those are coming from the atmosphere and from water. But then nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and chlorine, and then micronutrients in lesser amounts, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, and molybdenum. Those are essential in the soils in order to have good grapes. Now a lot of times uh, if, if the vineyard manager will go into the vineyard and all of a sudden in the summertime and you will see that instead of green, dark green leaves, they're yellow greenish. They know they have a problem and a deficiency, and most of the time they have a, a deficiency in boron or molybdenum in the soil. And so they'll have to spray the field with that, and then it'll bring it back up and everything will be hunky-dory. And then we, one of my students did a PhD on all of the trace elements and what are the things that are there and how they affect the flavors that you have got too. Classic terroir study was done by a professor at uh, Cal State uh, Sonoma, um, Terry Wright, good friend of mine, Iron Horse Vineyard, Sebastopol, so Northern California, and this is Pinot Noir. He had two vineyards, very, very close by to one another. Vineyard A had 42% clay in the vineyard, and the other one had 20% clay. But it's all Pinot Noir, same winemaker, same year, everything was the same, all those factors that I showed you at the beginning, uh, and they did a blind tasting. 
Everybody loved this Vineyard B. Why? Because it was softer tannins, bigger nose, uh, more elegance. And it was all the geology, all the soil differences that you have got in this particular case. That's terroir tasting. And this is what you can do up and down the valley. If we take you around the world, I did some work uh, down in Argentina. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and so here we are um, um, on all of the alluvial fans coming off of the Andes. That's Aconcagua, the heart, highest volcano that is there. But all, what's happening is these mountains are rising up. And then the streams are down cutting, and so you have all these terraces on the streams. And the highest ones are the oldest, and they have the highest caliche, and that's where you get the best uh, wines uh, uh, in that particular area. So the geology is affecting the quality of the grapes that you have in that particular area. You go to uh, Australia, where all the soils are red, red, red. This is bedrock down here. Uh, I mean, it, it is... Uh, there are no nutrients in those soils. So they're stressing the grapes and producing absolutely great heavy reds down there. The rule of thumb in the valley is the redder the soil, the better it is. The red soils mean well-drained, number one, and low nutrients, and that's what you really want, really want to have. So let's uh, finish up by talking about uh, Oregon. Uh, and so uh, wine industry goes back to 1961, as we'll see. Say, we call it David Lett Papa Pino. There were three guys that were working on their uh, degree uh, down at Ca University of California, Davis, which is Mecca for winemaking in the United States. And this was in the early 60s, and they said, we want to grow Pinot Noir. And the professor said, go to Oregon. Uh, and they did. And he started Irie Vine Vineyards. Uh, and Charles Corey uh, started a vineyard out uh, very close to Forest Grove, and there was another guy down in southern Oregon in the Umpqua. But uh, David Lett was the most successful. And in 1975, he took his Pinot Noirs to the International Pinot Noir Competition, which was in Burgundy. And they, it did very well. And it didn't want quite win, but the French said, Kiss, kiss, hey, Uwe, Oregon. You know, what is going on here? Where is this Oregon place? Uh, because they're starting to do it now. They realize uh, uh, that Oregon wines are really good. And in fact, the wine spectator for the world a few years ago, just two years ago, uh, seven of the top wines in the world were from Oregon. And many of them, Pinot Noir and then Syrah from, the, uh, from the, the other side of the mountains. So first planting, 1961. We actually are over now um, uh, 1,000 wineries. And then we have another three to 400 vineyards. You say, why, why do you have more vineyards? Well, there are a lot of people that are farmers. And there are a lot of wineries that have no vineyards. In the city of Portland, we have over 40 urban wineries. My favorite one, Hip Chicks Do Wine. Uh, and, and they need to buy their grapes from someplace, and they, they do those. And, and we, 70% of our grapes that we grow here in Oregon are red, 30% are white, and the reason is 59% of all of our grapes here are Pinot Noir. This is the land of Pinot, and that's primarily uh, because of the, the valley here. So the Willamette Valley, where we are here, cool climate grapes. I, I think we give, grow the best Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc and Pinot Noir in the United States. Now, some of my friends down in California say, no, we grow great Pinot Noir, and they are right in some places. Uh, and then all of these other ones, we, we, we do some great ones there. Uh, so number of wineries in the United States, California, oh, huge numbers. I mean, that's the big gorilla in the room. But number two is Washington, and we're number three. Uh, so we, we are, it's all West Coast. It's all low humidity that we have got out here and great growing areas that we have got. Um, but wine production, look what happens to Oregon. We go down to four. New York comes all the way up. Why? They have a lot of high volume things, Manischewitz and Ripple. Both have their headquarters there. And so volume wise, they, they are, uh, they're a lot more there. And then it's interesting, just like three weeks ago, the largest winery in Washington, Chateau Saint-Michel, bought the largest winery in Oregon, which was A to Z wines. And so you've got the two biggest ones combining. Uh, and the reason is they can't grow good Pinot Noir up there in Washington, and they wanted the, the equivalent down here. And, and the two went, uh, went together. But the effect on our economy, look at how much. This was a couple of years ago, 2021. Uh, seven billion dollars. We're over eight billion dollars now, and, and this year looks like it's just a great crop that we have got. So uh, it is very important for our overall economy that we have. And I mentioned here, wine spectator there, 
seven wines uh, in the top 100. So here is the king or the queen of grapes, the, the Pinot Noir grapes that we find all the way up and down the valley. And I absolutely love this thin skin red grape. Very, very delicate and uh, just wonderful. Now, in, in Oregon, we have all these AVAs, American Viticultural Association. Willamette Valley is one, and then you have the Umpqua Valley, the Rogue Valley, the Applegate, etc., the Columbia Valley. Um, and each one of those is defined by terroir. Uh, that region has the similar climate, the similar geology, uh, and, and everything is very, very similar, and that's what you put on the bottles. Now, in the Willamette Valley now, we've subdivided based on the geology. The people in Dundee Hills, which are primarily volcanic soils, they said, our grapes are better and our wines are much better than everybody else's, and so therefore we want to put Dundee Hills on it. Then the people in Yam Hills said, no, ours are primarily Willikensee type of soils, and we think our wines are better, and we want to put that on there. And then Chehala Mountain said the same thing, McMinnville said the same thing. Now we actually have nine different subdivisions in the Willamette Valley, uh, that you have got, and, and it's all based on terroir, which is, is kind of fun. So back when we started our study back in the early 90s, uh, with Dion Starpiece, my grad student, and myself, we mapped out the, the major soils. These are names given to the soils by the Soil Conservation Service, which is now called the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, and, and so the Jory soil, the Willikensee soil, and the Laurel Wood, those are the names that you find in a soil survey for each one of the counties that you've got. Uh, the second thing here is the rock. And so uh, Jory soil is primarily developed on basalt. Basalt is a volcanic type of rock. Where was the volcano? Where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come together. That was a hot spot. And between 15 and 18 million years ago, we had one flow after another after another that oozed out of that. And the all those flows got into the old ancestral uh, Columbia River Valley, pushed the water to the side and flowed all the way down to the Willamette Valley and all the way to the, the coastlines. All of your major headlands, uh, Cascade Head, Tillamook Head, uh, Yaquinta Head, Cape Lookout, all of those big, huge uh, peninsulas going out into the ocean, all are basalts that flowed all the way across the state of Oregon before they solidified. Uh, and then uh, go to Multnomah Falls, there are five different layers that are there. Those are all Columbia River basalts that you have got. Um, uh, uh, Willikensee soils are uplifted marine sediments. They were formed underneath the ocean. They are shales. They are sandstones, primarily, that have been uplifted that you have gotten. They're on the edge of the uh, coast range. And then Laurelwood soils that I've got here are basalt soils, but they have windblown silt that has come out of the valley bottoms because you have the, those incredible east winds in the, the wintertime. Uh, and what, what, what happens is it weathers. Now, the West Hills, right back of Portland, we have up to 150 feet of this windblown silt that we call loess, L-O-E-S-S. Uh, and, uh, but it, it, is, it is basically the same thing as the Missoula flood sediments at the bottom of the valleys, and it's too nutrient rich. But if you weather it for 100,000 years, it weathers into piezolites, little BBs. They, the uh, farmers used to call it shot soil. And the calcium, magnesium, iron uh, silicates, and it adds a festive uh, taste to these. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and, and so those are the three major ones. <coughs> woodburn soil is, is the Missoula flood sediments, the valley bottoms. Uh, and the woodburn soil is just uh, uh, way too nutrient rich. You know, it's great for growing hazelnuts, or as we native Oregonians call them, filberts. Uh, and then grass seed, hops, and uh, so many other different things that we have got. Oops. Uh, and so uh, just showing you the the geology of Oregon off the coast, we have the Juan de Fuca plate, the Gorda plate, that is being subducted underneath uh, North America. And it's uplifting all of the coastal sediments. And so we have the coast range that is down here. And so the edge of the coast range, uh, which is the, uh, the west side of the Willamette Valley, that's where you get all of these marine sediments that have been uplifted. Whereas where Washington, Idaho, and Oregon come together, that's where that original hot spot was, where all of the basalts came out and then flowed down. Uh, eventually it shut down and then it stayed right there and North America moved over it. And so the Snake River floodplain is all that same hot spot and that hot spot is now underneath Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and so the hot spot has had a great impact 
on the soils that we have got here. So the great debate in the Willamette Valley is which soil produces the best Pinot Noir and the best Rieslings and the Chardonnays because you get these different flavors that are out there. Is it the Jory soil, which is on the volcanic bedrock? Is it the Willikensee soil and the marine sediments? Or is it the Laurelwood soil, which is this old lust with the piezolites in it? Stay off of the woodburn soil yeah, that you've got there. Uh, so here are the red hills of Dundee up here. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so there are, the, uh, there are the Missoula flood sediments down here. This is what you want, these red, red soils. Here's an A horizon in the, uh, the, the Jory soil, and it is our state soil. And so why do we have a state soil? Why do we have a state nut? We are the only uh, uh, state in the United States with a state nut, that is the filbert or the hazelnut. Why do we have a state tree, a state song, a state rock, a state mineral, a uh, state fossil and all of those things. The reason is every kid in fourth grade gets a little blue book from the Secretary of State called the Oregon Blue Book, the Washington Blue Book, the California Blue Book, and it tells you why your state is special. So back in 1990, Soil Science Society of America said we need to have a state soil in each one of the states to highlight agriculture. And at that time there were five state soils, the first one being Wisconsin with the Antigua Silt Loam. Uh, and so I was president of the Oregon Soil Science Society, and I said, well, we, we need to choose one. And so the two characteristics of a state soil has to be high acreage in agriculture, number one, and very distinctive. Well, the number one soil in Oregon uh, is the, the Missoula flood sediment soils. Boring. It's a tan color. It's just nothing exciting about it. But the reddest soil in the state is the jewelry. Anytime you go down and drive through the South Salem Hills and look at those road cuts, red, red, red. Or you go on the other side of banks as you're going down to the coast. Red, red, red soils. And so we said it is the most distinctive soil in the state and it's number five in acreage uh, for um, the state of Oregon. So uh, we, we proposed it. It took me 12 years to get it through the Oregon legislature. And in Oregon we have a problem because you've got to unite the east side with the west side. And the east, and so the Jory soil is all on the west side of the Cascades because uh, soil is dictated by the amount of water and, and precip that you have got, and all the rainfall is over on this side. And the east side, you would never vote for it, and there were a lot of other infighting and stuff like that. And so 2009, my bill was voted the dumbest bill in the legislature. I was on every talk show in Portland. Lars Larson just took me to, to task. Why are we wasting taxpayers' money? Uh, and Bob Miller, same thing. And, uh, but then two years later, it passed. How did we do it? Because, I said, because it's all on Columbia River Basalt. And I told the legislature, first in the committees and then to the, the floors of the House and the Senate, this is a bill that unites the, the state of Oregon because it, all of that basalt magma came out of the ground in eastern Oregon flowed to the west side and weathered on the west side. And so it's, if it wasn't for the east side, we wouldn't have it in the west side. And it unites Oregon. They said, yes, and they passed it. And so to, just to prove you, oops, there, here it is. There is the, the resolution signed by everybody, Peter Courtney down there, and it passed. So we, we have the state soil yeah, that, uh, that we have there. And so here is the, uh, so I showed you the, um, uh, the Jory soil, this is the Willikensee soil, almost as red. All of them are red. Here's a bottle of wine for scale in there. And these are these little piezolites with a little Swiss army knife here, these little weathered iron magnesium uh, concretions that you have, silica concretions that you have got. And my PhD, uh, PhD student, Kat, uh, figured out all of that. So... How do these taste different? Well, it used to be you could pour, a, I mean, just doing the, the, the Jory versus Willikensee, which is the two ends of the spe uh, spectrum, marine sediments versus the volcanic. And, and the, uh, the other one, the laurel wood, is halfway in between. And it used to be when you pour the two bottles, I could always tell the Jory because it was always light red and the Willikensee very, very dark red. Well, Robert Parker in the 1990s developed a 100-point uh, scale for uh, scaling of wines. And if you got a 95, 96, that meant you were pretty good. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, what, but on, that, on his scale, it had to be darker. So the red wines had to be, the darker, the better. And so what has happened is most of the light red 
the jory soil. The pinots have disappeared. They have 5% grapes that they can mix in, and on the back part of the uh, property, they'll have a little uh, a p a petite Syrah or something like that. that will, they can add it in and make it darker. So color, but it, for me, it was always red plums, red currants, red strawberries, red cherries, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a strong bouquet versus black ones. Uh, which would be primarily blackberries, uh, bl black cherries, bl black crumbs. So black fruits versus red. Now Ken Wright, who was winemaker of the world for the wine advocate, front page, and I love his quote. He said, you know, to know Oregon uh, uh, wines is to know Oregon ge geology because you have to understand the geology and the soils. And uh, he was the very first winemaker that put the soils on the back of his bottles. And finally, in the late 1990s, I met him and I said, you know, you're my hero because you are putting the soils on your bottles. And he said, Burns, you're my hero because you're the guy that came up with the idea of the three major soil types and the three different flavors that you have got. And he says, no, Burns, you're a geologist. You guys are used to drinking wine out of a box. You know, what do you know about flavors and stuff like that? So he says, basalt more fruit driven flavors versus floral spice with lavender, cola, tobacco, cedar, and these. I mean, geologists don't know half those words, let alone figure them out. Uh, but, you know, it's coming from the, the world expert. Uh, but my favorite one is Adam Campbell. And he's out at Elk Cove, and it's one of the 10 oldest wineries in Oregon. And he actually has vineyards in all three of these soils. And he sells them as the uh, wine trilogy. Uh, and, and he says the marine sediments are black, cherry, and silk. So the darker colors on the Willikensee ones there. Uh, and then the laurel wood is blue fruit, like blueberries and stuff like that, and very earthiness. Whereas the volcanic is the red pie cherries, the red flavors, uh, and very, very spicy. And I like that. So the, the thing is, all of the winemakers will agree that they are different. Everyone has a different way of describing them. Now, I wish I had time to talk about the Umpqua, uh, which is down south. Uh, Umpqua and the Rogue Valleys and the Illinois Valleys, because they have Southern Oregon, great wines. Or I would love to take you up the, uh, up the gorge. And uh, the terroir there is really, really phenomenal for, from Hood River to, uh, to the Dalles, from Underwood Mountain, which is on the Washington side, all the way up to uh, uh, the, the areas right outside of the Dalles. It's, they say from Burgundy to Bordeaux in 40 miles. You have from cool climate to hot uh, climate there, uh, from the Pinot Gris and Pinot Noirs on Underwood to Zinfandels. And so it's a neat place there, too, uh, that you've got. And I wish I had more time to talk about Walla Walla with, with their big heavy reds uh, that they have over there. Uh, and so, it, uh, so the differences that we have here in the Pacific Northwest, Washington versus Oregon. Remember, Washington is uh, intermediate warm. And so they get in the Cabs, Merlots, and Syrahs over there. 95% uh, of the vineyards are on the marine uh, Missoula flood sediments. And you said, wait a second, Burns, you told us that they are just too nutrient rich. I'm right. But how do they cut down on the everything? They uh, control it by water. They have to irrigate everything. They give it just enough water to keep the plants alive. And that's how they stress the grapes out. Whereas here in the Willamette Valley, 90% of our vineyards are above the Missoula flood sediments. Uh, and, and we don't irrigate, and so therefore we uh, really put the stress on everything uh, by using old soils, red soils that you have got. In case you fell asleep, oh, I have, oh, we a neat new finding. So right now our, our top enology and viticulture program that we have in the state is down at Oregon State. And they've got some incredible people down here. And the whole valley, Pino is the king. And they developed a new hybrid grape that acts as an antidiuretic. And uh, it will reduce the number of trips that older people will have to the bathroom every night. And it's going to be marketed as Pinot More. <laughs> so, uh, so if you are interested, and we're developing it here in Oregon, and uh, get ready, go down to Freddy's, etc., cetera, in your local wine shop and ask for that. So, uh, so if you fell asleep in the beginning, what did I talk about? Well, terroir, the important eight factors that are very, very important out there. And all, every time, every bottle's gonna be different based on all of those eight factors that you got. Here in Willamette Valley, we control everything by the old soils. Whereas Southern Oregon, Eastern Washington, they control the vigor primarily by the water. 
Uh, and we are primarily cool climate grapes that are here, and we try and stay off of the Missoula flood sediments that, that we have here. Whereas eastern Washington, you're over into the uh, ter- uh, into the <coughs> uh, uh, you're you're more into the the big heavy reds. And so I hope, and my aim is, in life is to turn everybody into a terrorist. We aren't going to tell Homeland Security about that. But the, uh, we, uh, every time you go into a, a winery, I want you to ask, first of all, what is the year on the bottle? Because the year is important. In 1996 and two, uh, 2007, 2011, those were cool climate, great, uh, and, and not very, very good. Uh, and, and, and then also... What is the soil? Is it a jory? Is it a willow Kenzie? It is a laurel wood if it's in the valley here. Or marine sediments versus volcanic that you have got. And then what are the clones? Because the Pomard and Vadensville are the traditional uh, clones for the Pinot Noirs. But then what are, uh, what are the other Dijon clones? Because they will affect slightly the different flavors that you, you have there. And with that, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to christen all of you terroirists. And, and I want you to go forward and all, visit all these vineyards uh, and, and, and ask all of these questions. But I'm going to show you a couple of the Nordic ones that are here. And so let's go on. I'm going to mention five of them. There are more, probably over 10 here in the valley that we have got. But uh, Laurelwood Winery, um, 1974, Dev, David Tepola, I have to pronounce the, both of these, Tepola, um, was on the board when I was on the uh, Scandinavian Heritage Foundation board. Uh, and he was the first guy to actually uh, start growing grapes on the Willikensee soils because everybody had copied David Lett, who was on the Jory soils, and everybody was Jory, 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 and now he stepped out. And uh, now he died in 2006, bummer, but his wife Susan has taken over, and so I, I'm going to mention that. Ribbon Ridge and Ridgecrest Vineyards, um, it is an incredible uh, vineyard, and again, one of the founding fathers of winemaking in Oregon, and we'll talk about uh, Harry Peterson Nedry and his daughter Wynn, who has been very active here uh, in the Nordia House. And then Bergstrom, uh, their, uh, uh, 1999, they started their Jory and Willa Kenzie soil, so they're on, on two different mountains that you've got. Bjornsson, which is down in the Ola Hills, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then Leah Jorgensen, who also was on the board of the, the Scandinavia, I mean the Nordia house here, and, and she uses many different soils. So let me just show you this. So Laurel Ridge, 1974. Uh, and, and just out and back, he, where he, uh, David Teppola grew his first grapes, he called it Finn Hill. He was Finnish. Uh, and he, oh, unbelievably great Pinot Noirs. And then in the end, he, Phylloxera, uh, half of the Finn Hill got in. This is a little louse wart that gets in the, and kills the xylem and phloem and eventually slowly kills the plants over five to ten years. Uh, but he, so you have less and less volume that you've got. But his grapes that came off of that, he made it into a port, which is the best port I've ever had uh, from the state of Oregon. So that is one of the ones that we will probably be going to. So 74, he started it. Finn Hill was hit. Uh, interesting, he, he also teamed up with Charles Curry, one of the three guys that started winemaking in uh, Oregon. And, and actually, they developed a winery over in Forest Grove um, that is still there today. Uh, and, and then he eventually moved to Finn Hill later on. So Susan and his, uh, her two, two daughters own the winery today, and it's really, really good. And so they specialize in Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Chasselas, which is a Swiss grape. Uh, and that's the one that I used to use uh, when I made my uh, uh, wines with my students, Chardonnay, and then Blanc de Blanc, which is kind of like a, uh, um, a white uh, char- uh, champagne that you got. All right, how about the next one? Bjorn, uh, Bergstrom. So Bergstrom is down on uh, Shahila Mountain. And here is the, um, here's the barn and some of the major vineyards that are there. Uh, and let's see, uh, then also there's the major vineyard on uh, Shahila Mountain that you've got. Uh, and, and so this was started by John and Karen Berg, Bergstrom. John was a surgeon. Uh, and then his, uh, and they're of Swedish descent, by the way. And their son, uh, Josh, is the winemaker. So it's still in the family. Uh, and now they have uh, like five or six major vineyards on, on, the, on the Jory soil and on the Willa Kenzie soils that you have got. They have over 70 acres. Key thing here, they're biodynamic. Biodynamic is the ultimate organic vineyard. 
And now the good news is in Oregon, most of our vineyards are very organic and environmentally conscious. That is the Oregon thing. But a lot of people don't have the certifications just because it costs so much money to get those certifications. But they, they really want to do everything organically. The, the more organic you are, the, uh, the more the high quality, I think, that they've got. So they specialize in Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, they also get some Syrah from Eastern Washington. Uh, but they really, really good uh, winery that you have got there. Um, and then uh, Bjornsson uh, is down in the Eola Hills. And so this is the main uh, winery that you have got here. There's part of the vineyards. Uh, here is are some of the other ones. They're right up on the top. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, wonderful people. Uh, and so uh, uh, Mark and Patty Bjornsson, I can't remember what their heritage is, but the name Bjornsson, you, it's probably either Swedish or Finnish. Uh, Swedish or Norwegian, most likely. But they're mostly on Jory and Nakaya. Nakaya is a very, very shallow Jory. I mean, the soil's only that thick. And, and so the shallower the soil, the more stress that you put on the grapes, and those, those roots get right down into the bedrock. And Ken, um, uh, Ken Wright can, it says, I know when the roots go through the soils and into the bedrock because the complexity increases exponentially at that particular period of time. Uh, they have four major vineyards named after their four kids. Uh, the third and fourth vineyard uh, they put in, the, the guy who came in and tilled up everything said, you're crazy, nothing is going to grow there. That's what a winemaker wants to hear because it is going to really stress the grapes and they really are doing a great job. Also, very, very environmentally conscious. They have solar and wind there. They're salmon safe and live. Uh, live means low input viticulture and enology. Uh, also... They get the winds in the afternoon off of the Van Duzer, which cool the grapes down. Uh, and so all of the Aeola Hills have tinier grapes, thicker skins, and therefore you get in incredibly neat, rich flavors, which is really, really good. They're primarily Pinot Noir, and so Pomard, which is one of the major original ones, but then the Dijon clone 777, 677, 115, etc. I have 77 twice. Goop. And then a little Gamay Noir, Rosé, Chardonnay, Waxero, which is a neat white wine, which I really love too. So lots of possibilities that are there. Then we go up to Shehila Mountain and uh, Ribbon Ridge. This is the Ridge Crest Vineyard that is up there. Uh, and then here is some of the rest of one. But the story there is a dad, a daughter, and a hill. And the dad is Harry Peterson Nedry, one of the original winemakers uh, uh, one of the original 10 in the Willamette Valley. Uh, and he's gotten hundreds of uh, awards, and he is a gentleman and a scholar. And then his son, or his daughter, Wynn Peterson Nedry, who has been very, very active here in the Nordia house, uh, who just had a little baby. Uh, and, and, and so she's the daughter, he's the dad, and the hill is uh, the um, Ribbon Ridge. Uh, and so he started in 1984, 1980 planted, first crop was 1984, they got 41 acres up there. Originally, he started Shehelam Winery, very, very successful, and he said, nah, I just want to just dial it back and just concentrate on my favorite vineyard and the best wines that I have there and do it with my daughter. Uh, and they do that, and so he sold Shehelam, uh, and, uh, and then... Um, it's interesting because Ribbon Ridge became its own AVA in, in 2005. And, and so Harry was very involved in doing that. It's all Willikensee soils, all marine sediments that you have got up here. Now, it's interesting. Harry is one of these guys, right brain, left brain. He got a degree in chemistry and in English, uh, which sometimes you really need to do for... Uh, for a winemaker because you got to know the science, but you also, it's an art that you have, that you've got there. And then Wynne followed along. She also had a degree in chemistry and then eventually enology that is there. K Pinot Noir is the king up there, but then they also grow dry Rieslings, Gamay Noir, and Gruner Veltline, Veltliner, which is the wine that, it's a white wine that made Austria famous. And I think their Gruner Veltliner is the best around. Uh, so those are those. And then the last one is Leah Jorgensen, who also was on the, the board here. Uh, and, and Leah uh, has her cellars down in Newburgh. Uh, and she, her uh, ancestry is Danish and Norwegian. 
Uh, and mom is uh, Italian and Austrian, so you got uh, these four major uh, areas that are there. She grew up uh, down near Eugene, but she is very distinctive in Oregon because she loves uh, you, uh, making wine out of Cabernet Franc, which is the uh, cousin of, of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, and, and she probably is the best winemaker in the state for Cab Franc and for Gamay Noir. Uh, got it in there someplace. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there it is, right there. Uh, and so she has a little tasting room outside of, of Newburgh. So those are all, you know, potential ones. She also is in the Malbec, which is really, really good. Her husband, uh, Asa, and I, her son, Ivor, are also into the winery. So, hopefully next summer, uh, we will be advertising uh, one, maybe two wineries tours that we have. We generally have a small bus, uh, 20, 22 people, uh, and then we'll meet here, uh, and then we'll do three wineries in a day. You take a sack lunch along, uh, and then I will show you the geology, tell you the whole geology for in between each one of the wineries, and then at each one we'll talk about terroir and all of the things that make that winery uh, very, very special. Uh, and so we generally leave about 10.30 or something like that, get back at 5.30. Um, the, the, the real bummer thing is that the price of uh, tasting has gone up and up. So the cost, but I'm free, and they, you, know, you pay basically for the bus and the tasting fees that you have got. So watch for the uh, announcements. And so thank you very much for coming out on this incredible atmospheric river tonight. Hopefully none of our cars have washed away as we go out. And so thank you very much for coming, and all of you who are online too. Thanks. How many people were online? Huh? Okay. But how many? Okay, so 13 people were online. Good. All right, Steve. Excellent number. Yeah, I like that. Um, that was very import, uh, informative, and I'm sure the four folks here are looking forward to joining you next summer uh, as you uh, do your wine tasting and, and taste those different tar wars. That's right. Yeah. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience, and you have to wait till the microphone gets up to you because people at home will not be able to hear you if you don't speak into the microphone. Those of you at home, you can use the submit question or the, uh, the submit option on your computer. Questions? So I have um, two questions. One of them is if you could talk a little bit about ice wine and terroir. Oh. And then my second question has to do with what's happening with the use of chemicals and pesticides. And the background behind my question is talking to some young uh, PSU students who are from the Hillsburg area in California who talked about like years and years and years of what pesticide use has done to the soils. And I'm just wondering if you could compare that with what's happening here. Thank you very much. Kim, Kim and I uh, uh, teach at Portland State, so we've been friends for years and years. Ice wine, first of all, uh, uh, ice wine is generally made out of Riesling. It's a late harvest Riesling. Um, so the most famous places in the world for ice wine are Germany and then uh, the Niagara area in Canada. We make ice wine here. What you do is you, you leave the, the grapes on the, the vine uh, until they are like 28, 29, 30 bricks, very, very ripe. And then you, it goes through one frost. Uh, and then what you do, then you press it, so it's going to be very, very sugar-rich. Then you ferment it, but it doesn't uh, ferment totally. And so it is a sweet wine, anywhere from 3 to 6% residual sugar. It is the special wine that you take your honey uh, and you sit on that bearskin rug in front of the fireplace late at night, and it's guaranteed instant romance. Uh, and so ice wine is absolutely, you know, a wonderful, wonderful wine. And so we, we don't call uh, ice wine a lot here in Oregon. It's generally late harvest uh, wines that we have here, but uh, Canada is very, very famous for that. Uh, the second thing, pesticides, big deal, uh, because a lot of these pesticides... Um, don't break down and they hang around for a long period of time and then in the soils and then it gets picked up in the agricultural product that you have got. 
The good news is in Oregon and the wineries is that many of the people try and stay away from it. We, we don't have to spray an awful lot. Why? Because it's so dry here. The drier it is, the better. Poor people back east where it's humid, the temperature goes up at the beginning of summer and it, and it stays up all summer. It just it goes like this, whereas here it's up, down, up, down. Leads to complexity. Uh, but here in Oregon, we, we, most of the wineries will uh, spray maybe three, four times a year, whereas back east, 15 to 20 to 30 times a summer. And, and so all of those chemicals, yeah. Now, if you're biodynamic, it can't be anything organic. I, I mean, it, it cannot be um, an artificial type of thing. And so the Oregon thing is to not do a lot of uh, agricultural sprays. But some of the vineyards that are there were agricultural plum orchards, prune orchards, uh, apple orchards, and stuff like that, and they may have used it there before. And, and so it is something to always be concerned about. Good. Another question? Yeah. Uh, I understand that Merlot is rather hard to grow here, right? We don't see a lot of uh, uh, Oregonian Merlots here. Is that because of temperature? And will it eventually, as it gets warmer, have more Merlots available? Yeah, what was the key word? Something doesn't grow here. Uh, Merlot is rather difficult to grow in this area because of temperature, is that right? Is that Merlot. Oh, Merlot. Yeah. I, I, I didn't get the Merlot. Thank you. It's just not warm enough. But another 40 years, uh, we will be growing lots of Merlot here in the valley as the temperature goes, unless we do something uh, more drastic with the climate. Yeah. So uh, it, climate dictates the, the, the Cabs, Merlots, and Syrahs. You need to have um, uh, a lot more heat units. Good question. Yes. I was curious about Sauvignon Blanc. I see it in Salem. It tastes great. It seems to work a little bit around here. Also, is this going to be recorded so we can watch it again? It is. It be, yeah, it is going to be recorded. Yes, yes, it is recorded. So, so Sauvignon Blanc is. I, I love it. I mean, um, I used to live in uh, New Zealand and. Uh, the, my favorite Sauvignon Blanc in the world comes from Marlboro Sound. And it's, I use that as a great example of terroir. It doesn't matter which of the 50 winemakers that you have got there, it all tastes the same. It is so good. It's the, the soils, the climate, and the, uh, and, and the grapes that they use down there. But we, uh, we are right at the edge of Sauvignon Blanc here, uh, temperature-wise, and that is another one that more and more people in the valley are planting. We're, it's into that intermediate warm. Uh, and, and so Southern Oregon has been doing a lot of uh, Sauvignon Blanc. You're going to see more of it here. I like it. I love Sauvignon Blanc. And up in the gorge, they are also doing so. So you're going to see more of that. Any other questions? Yeah, any last questions? We have time for one more. There aren't any online questions. Scott, we were just recently in Portugal, and they were up the Douro Valley, and they were talking about schist, and I kept thinking, I've heard Scott talk about that in Norway. So two questions, do we have anything like schist here for growing wine, and when will Norway be growing wine? Oh, yeah, great question. So. You know, the geology, so uh, uh, the question was about schist. Schist is a metamorphic rock, high-grade metamorphic rock. I have a bumper sticker on my car that says schist happens, uh, and it does sometimes. Uh, and so in Oregon, we only have uh, metamorphic rocks way up in the northeastern part of the state, in the Wallowas. We have a little bit of schist up there and a little bit down uh, in, in the southwestern part of the state, in the Klamath. Not much of it. So for growing grapes, uh, schist really does not give a lot of great nutrients. It is one of those ones that is just not much is coming out of the, uh, the ground. But it, it, um, there's enough of, of, of stuff that is, is very, very good. And, and so, uh, so that's why we don't have a lot of schist around here. The second question was, uh, oh, Norway. Uh, that is a great question. Because the climate's warming, okay? 
15 years ago, Norway had two wineries, Sweden had two or three, and Denmark had four or five. Now, all of those have over 30 wineries because the climate has warmed up. So southern Norway, southern Sweden, and Denmark are now producing uh, wine, wine grapes. And, and England, England now has over 35. I mean, those were never, nobody grew grapes at all in the past. But as the climate has warmed up, everybody is saying, hey, they're going to grow. And so it's mostly cool climate grapes. And so they're going to be mostly white wines uh, that you have got. And then uh, and it used to be Germany was all white. Now they're growing Pinot Noir everywhere. It's a cool climate. So the climate is affecting things. And so, nor I mean, all of the different countries, uh, this, and, and Finland too, uh, are, are growing it. So yes, it is growing there. And I, I hope to try some next time I'm over there. Uh, I haven't tried any uh, there. It's good. It's good. I had some this summer. Oh, you did? Yes. Good, good, good. Thank you. Can you confirm a piece of history for me? I worked in Newburgh for 24 years, and the story that I always heard related to the Columbus Day storm, 1962, I think it was, mm -hmm. that it wiped out, that whole area was originally pit fruits, apricots, uh, all that kind of thing, and the Columbus Day storm virtually wiped out all of those, and you had all these farmers with the land in a long time to regrow a crop, and that's when the vintners came in said, let's, let's try growing grapes, and it turned out to be very, very successful. And that was the end of the pit, pit crops in that area. Yes. yes. How many of you remember the Columbus Day storm? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I remember, that was my homecoming mm -hmm. at Beaverton High School. Mm -hmm. And we, we did a, a parade downtown Beaverton, and all of our floats blew apart. <laughs> and, the, and, and, and the principal said, we're all going home. They got the buses, and we, we watched all these trees blow down and everything. And it was great. Mm -hmm. and, and so her question was, all of those orchards that, that were down in the Newburgh area, not only there, but over in Dundee and yeah. uh, all over Yamhill County, blew down. And for those, uh, 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 for those trees to come back, you're looking uh, 20, 30, 40 years to come back. And that was David Lett, Lett arrived David Lett. in 1961. That was 1962. Uh, that is the beginning of the wine industry right then afterwards. And they came in. And, and so the land was very, very cheap. And, and they started. And so some of the... Uh, He's the one that told me the story. Actually. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so... It, it, it's right, right at the same time. So very, very significant. Thank you. I, I didn't put the two together. I think that's very significant. All right, anything else? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Burns, for your lively discussion this evening. So I'll be around afterwards if anybody has any additional questions. And, and thank you to all the people online. Mm -hmm.